Well, hello everybody, my name is Roger. Welcome to my channel, Roger's Reads. So today I'm doing my December 2018 wrap up. Yes, I know, it's a little late. I usually do it at the very end of the month, but I was kind of out of pocket during the holiday season, so now I'm playing catch up. So this is part two of my December wrap up. I always do the first part in the middle of the month and then the last part of the end of the month, usually. Um, and as always, I will put a link to all the books below along with the time in the video that I discuss each one. So if you want to jump, to, so if you want to quickly jump to a particular book, you can do that. So the first book that I read in December was entitled The Granby Knitting Stories, written by Amy Lane. Now, I believe that these stories are only available in ebook format at the moment, and I put a link for each of the individual books as well as the collection, as well as the entire collection below. <coughs> So The Granby Knitting Stories is a collection of four gay romance novellas by Amy Lane and follows a group of fellows who either work or are, or are associated with an alpaca farm and fiber mill. Oh, and just about everybody in the story knits, and knits a lot, which is one of the themes running through this series, which I found cleverly unusual. So the first story is entitled The Winter Courtship Rituals of Fur-Bearing Critters, and follows Rance Crawford, who's a, a crusty, somewhat gruff alpaca rancher and the owner of the fiber mill. But his tough exterior softens when a handsome city boy, Ben, named Ben, moves in next door, and the next thing you know, Rance is knitting the newcomer hats to keep him warm during the uh, winter time. So this is a very sweet and charming novella. So things get a little bit more serious in the next book, which is entitled How to Raise an Honest Rabbit. So this follows one of Rance's employees, Jeremy, who we learned was a former con man, uh, pretty much forced into it by his father, and also an ex-con. But Rance gives Jeremy a chance, and Jeremy is determined to not let down his new boss. He's also determined not to let anyone get too close to him, but his co-worker Aiden is not so easily deterred. Aiden, however, has to tread carefully around the man who's accustomed to rabbit away at the first sign of conflict. And instead, Aiden must get Jeremy to trust him and to trust himself, which turns out not to be such an easy task, especially when Jeremy's past shows up one day at their doorstep. So the third, probably the darkest novel in this series, is A Knitter in His Natural Habitat. So this follows Stanley, who works at the knitting shop in Boulder, and who occasionally had dalliances with Rance before Rance met Ben. So in this book, there's a new delivery man in town named Johnny, who drops off a delivery at Stanley's shop, and both men are instantly smitten with the other. But Johnny is not quite as he seems, and we learn that he has a very dark past, which threatens to destroy everything he's been building with Stanley, as well as put the, all of the people that we've met so far in the book in extreme danger. And the last book in this collection is Blackbird Knitting in a Bunny's Lair. Now, I can't say too much about this one without giving anything away. Let me just say that one of our favorite characters is on a long road to recovery after a heinous event. And there's a new addition to our beloved cast of characters in this book. So this story is where it all comes together. And the author does a fantastic job of uh, pulling in the old heartstrings here. So I really love reading these stories about a group of passionate knitters and passionate men. And by the end of the last book, I found myself loving this this colorful and endearing cast of characters. At first, I thought this was going to be a sweet holiday story, and uh, ultimately it was. But there are some darker aspects to the story as well, which made it all the more compelling.
Additionally, I like the continuity with these four books in which each character appeared in every story and provided us an opportunity to really get to know them. So yeah, so I'm really glad that I read these uh, four novellas back to back, which start out with a sweet romance, then morph into the more dramatic, grow a tad darker as the stories continue to progress and culminate in many intense emotional experiences by the end of the series. All in all, I loved this moving and heartfelt series which can be enjoyed by anyone regardless of whether or not you're a knitter. So the next book that I read in December was entitled Percy Jackson and the Sea of Monsters, written by Rick Riordan. So this is the second book in the Percy Jackson and the Olympians series, and I enjoyed this book as much as I did the first. So the Sea of Monsters. This opens up a few months after the events of the first novel, with our favorite Half-Blood making an admirable attempt to fit in at school, or at least not to destroy his school. So he ends up befriending a massive, unpopular teenager named Tyson. Now Percy's feeling pretty smug about making it almost through the entire school year without getting expelled when <laughs> cannibalistic monsters attack Percy during gym class and the whole school ends up pretty much destroyed afterwards. Then Percy gets word that there's big trouble at Camp Half-Blood, so uh, against his mother's wishes he, along with Tyson, who is actually a cyclops as it turns out, and uh, his friend Annabeth, the daughter of Athena, rush out to camp to help. There, Percy learns of a diabolical plan to destroy the camp. Someone has poisoned the pine tree which strengthens the magical boundary surrounding the camp, and with the boundary now weakened, monsters are on the borders attempting to break in. So there's only one possible way to reverse the poisoning and restore the boundary, and that is to obtain the Golden Fleece. So uh, Percy, along with Annabeth, the daughter of Athena, and uh, Tyson, our friendly Cyclops, head off on the quest to retrieve the Golden Fleece from an evil creature who, as it happens, is also holding Grover hostage. Uh, if you remember, Grover is the satyr and Percy's friend from the first book. So the trio has to overcome all sorts of obstacles before finding the fleece, including some new enemies and an old arch nemesis. So like the first book, The Sea of Monsters was a fun, exhilarating, fast-paced story with a witty dialogue and non-stop action. And I really love the world that Rick Riordan has created here. Uh, the action is pretty much unrelenting, and the characters never lose their endearing uh, humanity. There's also a strong theme of friendship and family that ran throughout the novel, which really resonated with me. And all in all, this was a, a playful and rollicking book populated with lovable, memorable characters that kept me turning the page until the stunning ending. And I really can't wait to read the third book in this series. So the next book that I read in December was entitled Home for Christmas, written by R.J. Scott. Now this is a gay Christmas story, and uh, R.J. Scott is also the author of the Christmas Throwaway, one of my favorite LGBT Christmas stories that I've spoken a time or two on this channel in the past. So this story follows Connor, a man with a huge heart, who one night finds his friend River on the roof of the campus admin building. River is very drunk with a mostly empty bottle of vodka in his hand. So Connor ends up talking his friend down and then learns that River is without family and is planning on spending Christmas by himself in a rented budget hotel room down the road. Well, Connor does not want to leave River alone, fearful that he might end up on the roof again, uh, roof of a building again, or even worse, something worse. It's also worth mentioning that Connor has quite the crush on River. So Connor convinces a strongly reluctant River to come home with him for Christmas and spend the holiday with Connor and his two dads. 
Now River has some major issues and quite a complicated past which we learn about slowly as the story unfolds. He's pretty much built up these walls around his heart and is determined not to allow Connor to fix them as it were. But in spite of himself, River finds himself falling in love with Connor's warm and gregarious family and Connor ends up warming his way to River's heart as well, causing some of his carefully constructed walls to come crashing down. Now this is, this is actually book nine I think in the series and I wasn't aware of this at the time that I got it, but the book actually stood on its own just fine. Now I will say however that this was a feel-good, super sweet Christmas romance that revolved around family, love, and acceptance, and I absolutely adored this story. This book has a kind of characters that stay with you long afterwards, and I just may pick up the rest of the books in the series down the road. I liked uh, the characters here that much. So the next book that I read in December was entitled The Girl in the Tower, written by Catherine Arden. So this is the second book in the Winter Night Trilogy and takes place in the mid 14th century. So The Girl in the Tower by Catherine Arden picks up shortly after the events of the first book, which was The Bear and the Nightingale. So Vasya is on the run after being accused of being a witch and cast out by her village. So deciding against both life in a convent or life with a husband, Vasya takes off on her trusted stallion Solovey to see the world, a, a thirst for adventure in her blood. So given that during this time period it is pretty much unheard of for a maiden to go off, uh, off exploring on her own, Vasya disguises herself as a boy for protection. But she soon learns that the world is not without its cruelties as she stumbles upon village after village which has been burned down by bandits, many of the occupants of the village murdered and their young daughters stolen away. So Vasya eventually ends up in Moscow on the doorstep of her sister Olga and her brother Sasha who is a monk. Now, Vasya plans to stay only for a short while, feeling in fear that her masquerade might endanger her siblings, but she inadvertently ends up catching the attention of her cousin Dmitri, the Grand Prince of Moscow. So Dmitri, he is captivated by the brave and fearless young man named Vasily, who uh, he believes Vasya to be, which puts her Olga and Sasha's lives in danger as well as thrusts her in the midst of a political intrigue and treachery. So soon Vasya is caught up in this intricate web of lies and deception while carefully guarding the secret of her true gender and all the while attempting to remain in uh, Dimitri's good graces. But this proves a hell of a lot more difficult than she uh, could have imagined when she learns that there's a new evil force threatening her cousin's kingdom and she is the only one who can stop it. So like the first book I ended up loving this story. Uh, the vivid descriptions and the thrilling storytelling resulted in an immersive and enchanting read. Arden manages to expertly infuse fascinating historical facts with fantastical elements, giving us a, a spellbinding tale of uh, political intrigue and uprisings, uh, dark magic, deadly bandits, fantastical creatures, uh, religious extremism, adventure, deception, betrayal, and the dangers of hubris. But moreover, the author gives us a brave, kick-ass, and undoubtedly flawed heroine to save the day, a, a character in Vasya that you just can't help but fall in love with. And I can't wait to read the final book in this uh, bewitching series. I, I actually plan on doing a full review of this book on this channel as well in the coming days. 
So the next book that I read in December was entitled Freaks I've Met by Donald Johns. Now this is a humorous fiction novel that takes place in the 80s that I won in a Goodreads drawing. This follows a main character, uh, Jack Fitzpatrick, who heads to LA with the goal of learning how to become a bonds broker after reading the uh, best paying jobs of 1987 in uh, Newsweek magazine. Now, this follows his humorous adventures and misadventures and introduces us to an interesting cast of characters who uh, he labels as freaks. Now, I know a lot of people appear to love this book, but it just didn't work for me. Now, it's not because of the sophomoric humor, because I can be all about immature humor. Hell, I've been told a time or two that I have the humor of a 14 year old boy. No, but rather, what didn't work for me was that I found the main character racist, sexist, and homophobic. And when any character in a story uses the word fag in everyday conversation, that just plain kills it for me. So yeah, this is my one stinker for the month. So the next book that I read was entitled Exit Plans for Teenage Freaks, written by Nathan Burgoyne. Now this is kind of, it's kind of funny that I chose two books with the word freaks in the title, especially given that typically that's a word that I really dislike. So anyway, Exit Plans for Teenage Freaks follows a 17-year-old gay high school boy named Cole who, after pushing open the front door of his high school, suddenly finds himself many miles away at the museum that he had just been thinking about. When he's finally able to gather his thoughts, he can really come to no other conclusion other than that he somehow had just teleported from his high school to the museum. His suspicion is confirmed when it happens again, though this time he's placed in a much more precarious situation. So from there we follow a string of one awkward situation after another as Cole unwittingly pops in all over the place, even ending up outside of the glass shower door in which a boy from his school is showering. <laughs> Whoops! So, Cole figures out pretty quickly that any time he touches or walks through a door, he risks poofing to somewhere else. And it's usually whatever, it's usually to the place that he happens to be thinking about at the time. Cole then notices that there are creepy people who are staring at him whenever he teleports. And it doesn't take him long to figure out that these are people who may not have his best interests in mind. Eventually, he learns that these people plan to put a stop to his teleporting by any means necessary. So I really love this quirky and fun little story. It's an offbeat, wonderfully weird, immersive book with an adorable cast of characters. So I really, really hope that the author continues this as a series because I, I would love to read more about Cole and the others in this book and to learn more about this odd little uh, gift that he has. And a huge thank you to NetGalley for providing me a review copy of this book in exchange for an honest review. So the next book that I read was entitled The Evolution of Jeremy Warsh, written by Jess Moore. And this takes place in the late 1990s and follows Jeremy Warsh, uh, a high school senior and artist who, ever since his grandfather passed away, has put aside his comic art and has not touched it. Now, because he and his mom are struggling financially, Jeremy doesn't really count on being able to go to college and instead expects a, a boring life of, of drudgery working for minimum wage. Then things begin to slowly change for Jeremy. Uh, his best friend Casey comes out of the closet. He receives an unexpected gift from his father and his other friend Stuart begins dating. Inspired by his friends, Jeremy picks up the pencil and once again starts drawing and in so doing creates a sassy, wisecracking, no-nonsense, in-your-face kind of character he named Penny Kind. Now what's special about Penny, however, is that she speaks to him, literally, and is not afraid to expect and demand more from him than he's currently given. 
That is to say, Penny holds him accountable for all of his actions and inactions, causing him to continuously reevaluate his life and his decisions. This is especially true after he kisses a boy at a party and he begins to question everything he thought he knew about himself as new and confusing feelings begin to, uh, to surface. I really enjoy how Jeremy's art not only helps him cope with his problems and insecurities, but also shows him ways to overcome them, opening his eyes to uh, different paths that are available to him. It really was so much fun journeying along with Jeremy as he experienced the ups and downs of a life in high school. I found him to be not only a lovable and empathetic character, but also a wonderfully relatable and memorable one who revealed more and more of himself as his understanding of the bigger world around him unfolded. Additionally, the diverse cast of secondary characters in this book is truly delightful. These are characters who not only amuse and entertain us, but also touch us and prompt us to think about who we are and how we want to live our lives. The author really seems to understand the teenage soul, the, uh, the doubt, the uncertainty, the longing, the self-awareness, the challenges, and the confusion, and in so doing, ends up creating a believable world with plenty of heart in this novel. I also thought that the blossoming romance between Jeremy and Matt was soft, gentle, and very well drawn. You know, I like the fact that it was slow and not at all rushed, resulting in a sweet and heartwarming affection that didn't take away from the rest of the story. It was fun, however, to see Jeremy move from a place of doubt and confusion to a place of acceptance and certainty. So this feel-good story has everything you need for the perfect high school senior story. Uh, a tight group of witty and charming friends, a zombie homecoming dance, a high school senior identity crisis, an ultra cool mom, and a will they, won't they type of romance, and that somewhat melancholy high that comes with endings and new beginnings. All in all, this was a delightful story, and I'm so glad I read it. So the next book that I read this month was entitled The Far Field, and this was written by Madhuri Vijay. I don't know, hopefully I pronounced that correctly. So this was a Book of the Month Club selection for this month, and the synopsis sounded absolutely fascinating, so I thought I'd pick it up, and I was not disappointed. So the story follows a young, fairly well-off Indian woman named Shalini, whose mother has recently, had recently passed away, and Shalini is having a difficult time uh, dealing with and coming to terms with her mother's passing. So, so Shalini recalls a Kashmiri clothes salesman named Bashir Ahmed, who had visited her childhood home, and with whom her mother struck up a friendship, which in and of itself was rather unusual, given that her mother was hot-tempered, uh, sarcastic, critical, brutal, and mocking of pretty much everyone around her. She definitely was not a pleasant person to be around. Though I have to admit that many of her comments were really laugh out loud hysterical. But regardless of her mother's fault, Shalini was quite loyal to her mother. And regardless of the mother's disposition, Bashir would come to their house every couple of months and spend the afternoon with her Shalini and her mother. And it was during those times that her mother actually appeared happy and joyful, something Shalini usually didn't see in her mother. So Bashir's visits came to a sudden halt a couple of decades earlier, however, and it was shortly after that when her mother's mental health went downhill. So Shalini decides to head out to Kashmir to find her mother's long-lost friend, convinced that finding the man and telling him about her mother's death will somehow bring her closure with her mother's passion. Now, it's a risky journey for a young woman alone, given that uh, Kashmir is wracked by war and unrest. And that's precisely what Shalini discovers in the remote uh, Himalayan village where she finds herself. There, she immediately is integrated into the lives of a generous family who not only offer her shelter and friendship, but also protection. 
But the more her relationship with the local villagers and the family deepens, the more she unknowingly threatens their, their safety, especially when uncertainty and old hatreds resurface. So I loved how real this story felt to me. I often forgot that I was reading fiction as, I, as it felt like I was hearing a memoir from the mouth of someone who had just gone through a, a challenging time in her life. So the attention to detail and the rich descriptions of place in this story made me feel as though I were in the village right along with our protagonist. I also enjoyed the manner in which the story slowly unfolded, in which the author switches using alternating timelines from Shalini's childhood, where we learned about her and her parents, to the present day, where we are transported to her time in Kashmir. So we're allowed to see how Shalini's past shaped her to the person she is today for, for both good and ill. And I thought that she was a fascinating character and I enjoyed getting to know her as the story progressed. So the far field here is an extremely rich and moving coming of age story that deals with many loaded issues including class prejudice, guilt, uh, coming to terms with one's identity, forgiving ourselves, uh, regret, taking a good hearted look at our beliefs and our choices, and uh, learning how to live with and accept the sometimes terrible decisions that we make in life. So I ended up loving this hauntingly beautiful novel and uh, look forward to, to reading more by this author. I'll also be posting a full review of this book on this channel in the coming days. So uh, that is it for the books I read in December. Uh, how about you? What did you read last month? Uh, let me know in the comments. So that about does it. As always, I thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate all of your support. And uh, if you like this video, I'd appreciate it if you click the uh, little like button below as it really helps, uh, helps me and my channel out. And uh, yeah, so I will talk to you in the next video. Roger it out. Ooh.